that's when you win. It's it, at the point where they stop fighting you and start pretending to be like you. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Matt Kibbe. He's the head of Freedom Works, and he's the author most recently of the great new book, Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff, a Libertarian Manifesto. Matt, thanks for talking to us. Hey, Nick, how's it going? Okay, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. And then you've got a whole book after that. What, what needs to be expanded on? You know, I think I wanted to translate basic libertarian values into plain English. And, and people would always ask me, what should I read if I want to understand what, what libertarians stand for? And you'd say something like, go read Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments. Yeah. It's Which is too, another way of giving them the yeah, finger, right? It's, it's yes, another yes, way of saying, me, don't kid. even think about considering yeah. libertarianism. So I just wanted to translate it into, into basic values and get them to understand that, that what we talk about when we talk about freedom is really just common sense. Right. And well, and you talk about it, I mean, obviously, titularly, it's don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. You also talk about taking personal uh, responsibility, uh, that liberty demands that you are responsible, things like that. Uh, what you also talk about the non-aggression principle is very basic to your worldview. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, I mean it, the the whole basis of of peaceful cooperation is is not hurting people, um, not violating their rights, their most basic right to life. And you know, libertarians are a little bit different because they don't they don't want to start a fight with anybody. Mm -hmm. They want to be left alone. Um, when you apply that to foreign policy, um, I'm kind of a Washingtonian. It, it's 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 practical. And by that, you mean a George Washingtonian, not yeah. a, a Beltway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a George Washington, and he basically said, "Let's avoid entangling alliances." It was a pragmatic position for him. It's like, do we have money to nation right. build? Can we actually get involved in all this stuff? Well, in in the circles you travel in, Freedom Works, which you know promotes candidates and causes and issues around the country, you know, tr moving towards a more libertarian, free minds, free market type of thing, there seems there's you know there's a lot of fellow traveling with conservatives who seem oftentimes to be well, you know what, libertarianism or limited government stops at the water's edge. Yeah. And um, are you finding that's changing? Are conservatives, more broadly speaking, you know, finally starting to question a kind of emphasis on overseas nation building. Yeah, and I, I think that's a return to where conservatism came from. I always thought that libertarianism and conservatism were always kind of mashed up, and there was a skepticism about, about, about foreign um, uh, aggression, and you're seeing it in Justin Amash and, and Rand Paul and, and the trend from the Republican classes in 2010 in 2012. Are they principled about that or are they situational doves uh, kind of where, you know, okay, because, you know, Democrats who didn't have a problem with uh, uh, Barack Obama talking about bombing Syria are actually bombing Libya. Yeah. You know, they were against the Iraq war after they voted for it and things like that. Are the Republicans going to become hawkish again if and when they take the Senate and the White House? Well, I think it's both. I think it's easier to oppose a Democratic president when he's proposing to bomb Syria. But I think it's a serious philosophical shift as well. And you're going to see more and more Republicans challenge a Republican president if, if, if he or she starts trampling our civil liberties, if, if he or she starts proposing this kind of uh, blank check uh, nation building. You were uh, critical, obviously, of the George Bush administration and the Republican Congress under George Bush, also critical of uh, Democrats. Are we getting to a point where back to back you have a kind of nightmare scenario of conservative Republican government doing everything they say they're against. You know, they blew out the budget, they expanded entitlements, they made war overseas after promising a humble foreign policy. With Obama, you have a guy who came in saying, I'm not, I'm going to close Gitmo, he kept it open, I'm going to get us out of dumb wars. He tripled troop strength in Afghanistan, he's terrible on civil liberties. Is this like the set, setting the table for a great libertarian reaction to just say, look, we've tried it on the right, we've tried it on the left, now let's try it libertarian style. I do think that is the trend. And I think a lot of the reason you're seeing so many people interested in libertarian ideas is the failure of the Republicans, the failure of the Democrats, but also the ability to go get the information for yourself. You're not, you're not waiting for the RNC to tell you what to think anymore. And uh, you know, I tell a story in the book about Justin Amash trying to figure out why he didn't quite fit in with Republicans uh, he just typed it into Google. Right. Up pops F.A. Hayek. I think more and more young people are, are building their own curriculums mm -hmm. and get, didn't get it in high school, didn't get it in college. But all of a sudden, 
Um, all the things that I struggled to find when I was a teenager, you can find with just at your keyboard. Uh, talk about how that plays out in political organizing, because that's you know one of the things you do. You're kind of a community organizer, a political organizer. You have some fun with that in the book, given that those are often words described, you know, used to describe a, a Barack Obama. Uh, but you know, how how does the internet and the decentralization of knowledge help change political battles? You know, it lowers barriers to entry for citizens that want to know what their government's doing. It makes it easier for people to connect with each other without a middleman through social media. And if you think about it in public choice terms, uh, what, what do the power mongers do? They monopolize information. And if, and if that wall comes down and the shareholders and the voters know what's going on in Washington, I think it's a fundamental shift in the balance of power in our favor. And you're seeing that with the emergence of the Tea Party, with the emergence of the Ron Paul Revolution, all of these trends towards democratization and decentralization um, make me more optimistic about the future of, of, of actually reigning in Washington and, and getting a seat at the table for libertarian ideas. Uh, let me push back on that a little bit. I mean, I love to hear that that's music to my ears, but you know, we are now in a position where uh, the president has released his budget plan for the next 10 years, and in 10 years out, he wants to be spending $5.9 trillion. The Republicans came out with their program. They want to spend $4.9 trillion in 10 years. You know, what are we winning here? Or are we just kind of deluding ourselves in, you know, on internet chat groups? Well, you're, 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 you have this clash, and, and there's a lot of people in Washington, John Boehner and Mitch McConnell being two on the Republican side, that are essentially protecting the status quo. For, they're from the old system. And they think that, that cutting spending is bad politics. They have a lot of uh, crony interests, including defense interests, that want to see more and more spending. And then you have this, this new class that, that's pushing against them. We haven't reached that tipping point yet. And that's the Amashas, the Thomas Masseys, yeah. the Rand Pauls, the Mike Lees. And there's, in a historic, if you look at it historically, there's a lot more fiscal hawks, small L libertarians in Congress, I think, in, in the history of America. Um, but we haven't reached that tipping point yet, but the, the clash, that, that civil war within the GOP, it tells me that we must be knocking on the front door right now because they're getting really hostile about it. Um, how, much, how much of this shift uh, within the Republican Party is generational? I mean, all of the Tea Party guys, for the most part, are you know, 50 or younger. Um, and is there any washover into the Democrats as well? Because obviously, you know, great systemic change is not going to come from one party. It's got to be consensus, you know, a broad consensus. Yeah, I, you know, the, the problem with the Democrats today is that the radical progressives did a very good job of taking over the Democratic Party. And I think, I think the biggest window for, for libertarians is not to create a third party, but to actually take over the Republican Party. Well, and that's your uh, previous book, Hostile Takeover. Yeah. Um, but who are the, Demo uh, the radical progressives who took over the Democratic Party? Who are they? And are they the younger ones as well? I, I do think it was bottom up. It was, mm -hmm. it was this same decentralization. Um, you know, Barack Obama would be one right. of them. He, yeah. he was not the party's choice in 2008. Nancy Pelosi became speaker, but the progressive caucus in the House used to be a, a handful of people, mm -hmm. guys like Bernie Sanders. Right. It's not the same anymore, but it came from the outside in. It wasn't an inside job. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you in one of your chapters, uh, you quote the uh, old Who song, Won't Get Fooled Again, and it's the same as the old boss. And you have a line in there where you say, uh, to young people, or being a young person, it sucks to be young today. How does that uh, kind of you know, echo the larger themes of the books and, and the, the looking towards the future of reigning and spending? Well, I'm talking about generational theft and, and the way that we're spending so much money we don't have that's going to that's gonna get dumped in their lap, specifically about Obamacare, which, which is the most uh, obscene reverse Robin Hood. We're, we're making, forcing young, healthy, less wealthy people to cross-subsidize big insurance companies and older, wealthier people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that sucks, right? And it, it, it sucks to be young because that's on top of all this other generational theft. So that's it's, Medicare, uh, existing Medicare, Social Security. All of the unfunded liabilities mm -hmm. that, that won't be there when they get older. And on top of that, they're still living with their parents. They probably got 50 grand in college I, debt. As a parent, I see that more as a cost on the parent, not on the child, but. Yes, and uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi today, of course, celebrates joblessness as some form of liberation. Um, and I think uh, kids, if you don't, get a job, 
right out of the gate, it affects your career, it affects your life. And, and this is the opportunity. The American dream was always doing better. I'm not sure that's true for young people today. What, um, you know, what, what are the things that the government should be doing, say, to you know, kind of uh, perk up the economy or get out of the way of an economy? Uh, you know, and what are, what are the specific spending cuts? What are the broad numbers that we have to start cutting, uh, in your estimation? You know, I, I, think, I think there's no beautiful way to redesign the federal budget. I think you put everything on the table. And I think, I think people that leave defense off are making a big mistake because it's not credible. Um, entitlements. Have Nor to, is it necessary, right? I mean, you know, uh, defense spending right. in the 21st century is more than, uh, you know, it's gone up 75% in real terms. We're not fighting two wars anymore. I mean, if anything should be cut, it would seem like that's a no-brainer. Yes, and, and any federal bureaucracy, even if it's a, an, an essential function of government, I think any federal bureaucracy is better off in a budget-constrained environment because it forces them to make choices just like everybody else. Um, uh, you know, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, uh, Pat Toomey, there's all sorts of plans to balance the budget. Um, we actually crowdsourced the Tea Party Debt Commission that put everything on the table. Um, entitlements are tougher, um, but I think, I think the mantra there should be choice. Um, don't, don't just cram down on a system that, that takes from young people and, and gives them less and less over time. Why not let them save for themselves? That would get the unfunded liabilities off the books. You talk in the book, uh, particularly about young people, that you, you at Freedom Works, you guys did a uh, poll where you asked young people, would you, you know, like things the way they are, or would you like a government that spends less and does less? And you found, you know, and you, you can always question the wording of this, but you sure. found broad consensus that people are willing to say, yeah, give me less, but tax me less. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think that's true, and I think young people are naturally, they're sort of a genetically libertarian when you're young because you, you like challenging authority, you like uh, um, controlling yourself. The problem they have today is finding that product in the political marketplace. Mm -hmm. We know what the Democrats are for. They like top-down. Um, it's not at all clear what the Republicans are for, and I think that's an opportunity for a party or a candidate to step in and say, hey, check out freedom. Um, talk a little bit then about the midterms coming up as well as, you know, let's crystal ball a bit about um, 2016. Who are the candidates who excite you? What are the causes or the movements uh, beyond the Tea Party more specifically? What are the issues that you see as going in a libertarian way or where there's a strong case for a kind of libertarian limited government perspective? Well, you know, of course, Rand Paul just got a standing ovation at Berkeley for right. talking about civil liberties and, and reigning in the NSA. We've actually joined Rand in his, in his, loss, his class action right. lawsuit. I think that's a key issue. I think civil liberties are a big thing and a great one of those teachable moments where you see what abusive, unfettered government mm -hmm. power is all about. That connects with young people perhaps more then, uh, you know, let's lower marginal tax rates. And, and Rand Paul's been talking about that. Um, the field in 2016, at, to a person, is far more compelling than the Republican field in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, Rand Paul's making some headway. I think that's pretty interesting. He's developing some real communication skills. Right. But even go down that list, everybody, uh, Ted Cruz, uh, Scott Walker, Marco Rubio, go down that list, and they sound more like us than virtually anybody in the 2012 field. Where does, uh, talk about immigration, because this is a, another, you know, and I'm thinking as you, you mentioned those people, and Rand Paul just recently has said, you know, we got to get past being, uh, the Republicans have to get past being the party of deportation, uh, which is causing a hullabaloo on the right, because they're like, oh, that's amnesty, or that's this. You know, what is, what's the preferred path that you lay out for immigration reform? You know, I've actually talked to, to some of uh, the people I most respect in Congress about writing our immigration mm -hmm. bill. I think the principle is quite simple. If you want to come to this country and work, we want you. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the honest disagreement is whether or not you should arbitrarily change the rules once people broke them because they couldn't get in through a rational legal process. Um, Marco Rubio made a huge mistake by letting uh, Chuck Schumer and Dick Durbin write his bill as if the Union Democrats wanted to legalize um, mm -hmm. work. Right. Um, they don't. But, but I mean, but how, in a, in a, from a libertarian perspective, I mean, you, it's, it's hard to say, okay, well, something like E-Verify, where it essentially forces all of us to have work permits, uh, whether you're born here 
whether you're here legally or illegally. That seems like a bad idea. Uh, Adam Smith, uh, you know, who, who's not a fan of militarized borders, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you know, is is it does it I mean, doesn't any kind of immigration reform ultimately have to say, you know what, the people who are here, whether they're legal or not, we have to we have to say yes. And I mean, the you know, what is the harm of having lots of people in the country who weren't born here? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any harm. And I, I think I think the, the the nature of our country um, embraces that, but I think from a practical point of view, how would you actually get from where we are today to mm -hmm. where we need to be? It would be better to look prospectively and rationalize the process by which mm -hmm. good people come here to work. Mm -hmm. um, this anything that's omnibus anymore, mm -hmm. it contains so much garbage, and I, I don't I don't support the the bill that the, the Senate passed, and I'm not uh, I'm not an open borders guy because mm -hmm. I just don't I don't think that's means anything mm -hmm. in the context of how the world actually works. Uh, talk a little, you know, uh, one of the uh, curious things, the book is a, is a great read. I mean, it's really, uh, I don't want to say well-written in that sense, patronizing. I mean, it's a totally engaging read. Uh, early on, you talk about what you learned from Saul Alinsky. And of course, you know, over the past decade or so, Saul Alinsky has emerged from relative anonymity to one of the great bet noirs of the broadly construed right. Uh, you know, he's the ultimate community organizer. He wrote Rules for Radicals. Uh, Glenn Beck made a kind of a, a career launch by attacking Saul Alinsky and saying that he's has thoroughly infiltrated the Democratic Party. What did you learn from Saul Alinsky? You know, when, uh, when we were forming FreedomWorks, we were actually reading all of the leftist literature and we actually read Saul Alinsky before it was cool. And, and I was comparing the rules for radicals to the rules for liberty, mm -hmm. and I realized how situational and how manipulative Alinsky is. It was never based on principle. You read his book, it's actually dedicated to Lucifer. Mm -hmm. um, Google it sometime and, and watch his fans try to rationalize that mm -hmm. one. But I think his point is, um, this is all about manipulating people into doing something they don't wanna do. Mm -hmm. Rules for liberty, on the other hand, are, are clear, they're transparent, they're equally applied across the board, they're simple. And that's why I think we could win mm -hmm. if we embraced those basic rules. Mm -hmm. Where, um, you know, what is the next step forward in terms of turning, I mean, because you're very much working within the Republican Party apparatus, whether it's a hostile, you know, and it will be a hostile takeover, but when will you know that you have a, uh, you know, a kind of governing majority? I, I think we we know when the community, the people that actually organize and and understand the ideas of liberty, is big enough to matter so much that that we don't have the fight. The fight's over, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're debating about whether or not uh, you know Greg Brannon or Justin Amash should be the next presidential candidate. Um, that's when you win. It's it, at the point where they stop fighting you and start pretending to be like you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Matt Kibbe. Thanks, Nick. Head of Freedom Works and also uh, author most recently of Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff, a Libertarian Manifesto. Thanks for talking to Thank us. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.